Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Welcome back to another episode of Inside the Mind of On Carl B TV, brought to you by Moby Tech Queensland, Glenn. Brought to you by Moby Tech Queensland. My guest today is Sam Pearson. He's recently finished his PhD at UQ. He was a former student of Bill Von Hippel, who I have had on the podcast in the past. And I should have asked this before we started, mm. but your profile on ResearchGate says you're a doctor of philosophy. Yeah, yeah. So is that your new gig past the <laughs> PhD? No, not exactly. That's uh, where every, anyone that does a PhD, that's basically what the title is, Doctor right. of Philosophy. Okay. Yeah, that's it reflects the title more so than the actual field of study. Ah. Yeah, so anyone that's done a PhD in like English literature or even in um in science or biology, it's Doctor of Philosophy. Yeah, it's just a hangover from the seventeen hundreds or <laughs> Whenever that was minted. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Like, yeah. I guess I can see how psychology links to philosophy, but then mm. like Eng- English literature, I, uh, yeah, okay. I understand the link there. Um, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's not as, not as uh, I guess, removed as like a medical doctor, which is often yeah. what you get confused for. for. But yeah, it does prompt a bit of questions from people. Definitely. Yeah. Could, should I have introduced you as Dr. Sam Pearson? Oh, not at all. Have you changed <laughs> like your driver's license and everything to say no, Dr. I haven't. No. It still doesn't. It still feels like, like I'm a bit of an imposter. Yeah. Um, and whenever I have mentioned it, it's you always get the whole like, oh, you're not a medical doctor or whatever. So, yeah, I mean, I'm not too fussed about the, the title in particular. Um, yeah. And I guess, you know, when you're in academia, every second or everyone is a doctor, a doctor so it's not really anything special i just yeah. found that funny like people are like oh you're not a medical doctor yeah yeah like who's signing- saying that to you oh you mate know? everyone <laughs> like yeah yeah i was at land forces conference which is yeah. uh, uh i guess like a weapons expo in um in brisbane and yep. uh, i was like i had the doctor on my little name tag and yep. yeah people that i would be introduced to and would talk with would drop that line. So Stop I basically it, resigned it. myself to the fact that I've signed myself up for a life for <laughs> being called not a medical doctor. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's interesting <laughs> for someone. And you've obviously like, so you're just, let's go through some of your research mm. areas real quick. You yeah. uh, have, uh, well, research areas consist of social intelligence, yep. uh, social innovation, uh, sorry, cross-culture psychology, which I think would be really cool psychology, yeah, to talk yeah. about. Um, perspection, prejudice, and overconfidence. But yeah. so, like, obviously, quite social heavy. Yeah. Like what does it yeah, tell yeah. you about people who are snubbing their nose at you for not being? Oh, a medical mate. Doctor? Yeah. Good question. I guess the combination of like mostly ignorance and um, you know just willingness to have a bit of a quip. But yeah. I think it's good that you know in Australia people are so casual about it. I mean, um, there's not too many academics that go around big noting themselves that they're a doctor or a PhD. Of course. And so I think everyone's pretty chilled with it all. Yeah. 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 No, I, yeah I just found that really funny. But yeah. I, I guess so. Like if it is just banner, which is a lot of our culture anyway, then, then that yeah. is, that is quite great. But I'm, I was thinking of just some bloke that was like, Hmm, <laughs> not a medical doctor, eh? Like, yeah. yeah just- <laughs> no, I'm mainly just banter, but, um, you know, obviously if it tells you anything, it's they're not too original with it yep. because it's happened so many it's times. So many times. I've only been a minted doctor for a month. <laughs> <laughs> yes, one month. Yeah. So yeah. I, I guess, yeah, that imposter syndrome is, is such a, mm. a massive thing. And I, I, like how, I don't know, like, do you think you'll ever be comfortable with that title? Yeah. I mean, I think it'll hit home more after I've had more years working in academia. I mean, I still identify more as probably a PhD student. Yeah, and sure. All my friends are, you know, they're in that stage where they're a student or just finishing up being a student. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I hang around with people that are students or, or recently early career researchers. So, you know, maybe once I get into my 40s, get a bit of beard <laughs> growth and start kicking around with old profs, then, yeah, yeah maybe it'll be, it'll feel... Yeah, home. you might yeah. change that internal label a little bit. Exactly. Yeah, get yeah. get the elbow patches on the yeah. sleeve jacket and <laughs> the yeah. shoulder pads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, mate, it'd be classic. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, how, so how long did you study for? So did you do a yeah. psychology degree first? Yeah, so it's been then- it's been a long road, I guess. Um, so basically straight out of high school, I went and studied a Bachelor of Psych Science at UQ, which was four years, including an honours year. Okay. And in that honours year, that's where I sort of decided that I wanted to pursue research as a career. So when I was in my undergraduate sequence, the plan was for me to go and, and do medicine. Um, I mean, my plan was yeah. to do medicine. <laughs> so I sat the GAM, sat and everything like that. But in the process of doing that, I was doing my honours year and then doing this uh, research project with Bill as my thesis. And it made me realise how much I love psychology, how much I didn't want to do medicine. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, I, you know, at the end of my fourth year, I was like, no, nope, locking the PhD. Bill was happy to supervise me. Awesome. So it's been a total of eight years in tertiary education. Wow. Yeah. It's been a long and enjoyable ride. Yeah. It was almost a path of least resistance going from honours into PhD because, you know, I already knew that I got along well with Bill. I enjoyed his research and his approach to it. And so, yeah, things just flew on from there. Yeah. And like you said, you had that interest, right? Like yeah. you had that knack. Like, yeah, um, yeah plans change all the, all the bloody time and sometimes you just got to listen to, to what's in front of you or let, let life sort of take you, hey? Exactly. And, and to that note, when I was choosing who I wanted as a supervisor, uh, like Bill was definitely up there in contention as to, you know, whose research I was interested in, but it was only really until I met him in person and had a talk with him that I realized like, yeah, this is the guy for me. Yeah. Such a great bloke. So yeah. humble. Like I, we were just speaking really briefly before we started, just the language that he uses. Mm. Like, yeah, he, if you haven't watched that podcast yet for everyone listening, uh, he mm. was, I think episode 18. Uh, the first one of season two. <laughs> Thanks, Glenn. Nice. Thanks for being all over it. Um, but no, he, he authored The Social Leap and it's a, it's a book that sort of uh, takes you through or takes you on a journey of our progression from living in the jungle to, to where we are today and how we had to develop socially to survive. And mm. one example that I remember that just sticks to me is if like a lion's pursuing you and you're one person, you don't have much chance beating a lion, but if you're in a group of people and you can communicate and, and some people throw rocks and other people do X and mm. it, you're now protected and you're safe. And yeah, just so interesting to think about our evolution and something that I think naturally, and I've been curious about, but tertiary education for myself mm. has never been something that I enjoy doing. And it mm. could have been because of what I chose to study, which was teaching. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's cool to be able to still learn about that stuff. And, and again, that book, which is so easy to read and so cool to, to mm. I guess, get an understanding of where we've come from. Yeah. Yeah. And so did you see that? So you, like the parallel, obviously meeting him, his language and the way he spoke to you and the way you knew mm. he would teach you was similar. Yeah, I mean, I, I was fortunate enough to take one of his second year courses when I was in my, an okay. undergraduate. Um, and then I later went on to teach that as a PhD student. Oh, and that wow. course is always a, a standout for me. It's one of the most enjoyable courses at UQ's undergraduate program. What was the course? Uh, it's called Psych 2063. That's the code okay. of it. Yeah. And it's complex approaches to psychological problems. And so what the course uh, entails, and Bill's actually thinking about writing a book on this, but just didn't have the publisher interest to yeah. pursue it. But um, it's, it entails going through um, a fair few controversial issues in psychology, such as the gender pay gap, um, amongst others, and trying to gain clarity on you know, you know, what is the truth surrounding these issues using data. So it's a very data-driven course. And, um, and that was mind blowing to me because before that point, I never really saw how you could apply data science to the, to solving these complex problems. Okay. This obviously reflects the, the ground truth that humans aren't very statistically savvy. Yeah. Um, you know, we don't have quite a, a good grasp of probability unless we're taught it. And so we become prone to a whole bunch of biases and thought heuristics that can lead us to false conclusions. And so that course was a, a big mind blow amongst others that I took. But um, for that course in combination with the research Bill did and just speaking with him in person made me really set on uh, working with him. And we also, he's also a good bloke, so we got along well interpersonally. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and that led me into studying overconfidence in my, um, my fourth year. Yep. And um, that led me into, from overconfidence, led into social intelligence. 
Beautiful. So, yeah. so was that what your PhD was based around? The social. Well, originally, my PhD, the plan was to pursue the to follow up the work I did on overconfidence in okay. my fourth year. Yep. Um, but then it kind of morphed into more of a social intelligence focus. Right. Yeah. Yeah, this is just me guessing, but so yeah. as you learnt about overconfidence in mm. people, it's sort of like correlated with social intelligence, maybe. Yeah, they're very they're very similar yeah. uh, topics. They overlap a fair bit because overconfidence has quite an interpersonal utility, um, but social intelligence appealed more because there was more to uncover there. So there's been some work done on over uh, correction social intelligence before I came onto the scene. Hasn't been hasn't been very good work, right? Um, you know, it's been important to like establish the field, and uh, you know, it's it's always the person that needs the courage to take that first step, yeah. right? So I don't want to downplay that at all, but um, it's just a very hard area of research to to do properly. Right. And so Bill and I both saw ways of really improving that, and because that had a bit more impact, that's why. Well, I thought it had a bit more impact. That's why I decided to pursue it. Yeah. yeah. And so like I, I recently watched your three minutes thesis, mm. actually watched it a couple of times. And yeah. You spoke about, uh, well, and maybe if I'm misremembering, you can correct me, but mm -hmm. uh, the research around social intelligence was more to understand just about us rather than improve people that might be struggling. And you highlighted like five, five key things. Mm. Uh interpersonal magnetism was the title which i thought was a really yeah. cool term yeah yeah uh, but but yeah like the the story that you told of the bloke who's staring at his computer screen yeah. and playing that game for six hours he was a king in the game but yeah. and, but not so outside of it and mm. the game was more engaging and led to him taking his life um it like, is that what and i know that that's when you want to focus on moving forward but was that what is that what you and bill were, what was working on was how do we improve people that might be struggling like how do we identify characteristics and ways that we can uh, make people live happier more mm. socially viable lives yeah that's that's a good question it's that was a more tangential goal to what we were focusing on because i guess there's two issues here there's actually quite a lot of work done on trying to improve people's social functioning but empirically, that's done for people with ASD, aut right. autism spectrum disorder, or work that's done on non-clinical populations is not empirical. So if you go and Google social intelligence, you'll come up with a lot of self-help books right. and courses and maybe things like NLP. Um, and then- Sorry, what's NLP? Oh, it's, it's, a, it's a pseudoscience called neurolinguistic programming, okay. which is like- uh, amongst other communities including like business and whatnot it's employed by like people called pickup artists sure seeking to like improve their chances with women yeah so it's like a a, a primitive approach to it sounds like a bit lofty saying that but to improving yeah. people's social intelligence so there yeah there's a lot of a lot of pop psych work done on trying to improve people's social functioning but it's very flawed and right. has no empirical basis and the empirical stuff that has been done is focused on clinical populations. Okay. So in order to develop a way of improving someone's social intelligence, you first have to understand what it is. And you also need to understand the individual differences in social intelligence. So what makes you know you more socially intelligent than me just from the get-go? Like why why do people differ in how socially intelligent they are and how socially effective they are? So that was our first step to try and do that individual differences research before we sort of delved into any applied interventions to try and improve it in people. Okay. Yeah. Have you, um, have you, are you across, uh, obviously Jordan Peterson, everyone knows that. Yeah. Like yeah, these yeah. Days, but have you done his uh, thing? I don't know if it's called a personality test, but understand myself. No, see, I would, I would be hesitant to do any personality test that, that wasn't extensively supported by the literature. So, yeah. you know, personality is obviously huge, uh, focus of mind and in social intelligence research yep. um, because it, it predicts how you're received by other people and what you tend to do interpersonally. Um, and there's only really one gold standard personality test, which is called the Neo five factor inventory. Okay. So, I mean, Jordan Peterson's measure is probably valid, but yep. it's, it doesn't have, you know, years worth of support. Sure. So, I wouldn't really give it the time of day. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Um, yeah. I thought, I thought it was quite fascinating. Mm. Um, I, I like it sort of 
it doesn't lump you into categories, but yep. it tells you where you sort of sit on different spectrums, like intro, introvert mm. versus extrovert, and Trojan then extroversion. openness versus mm. uh, the other one. <laughs> Showing yeah. my my uh, ability, but yeah, I, I thought like I thought it was a great way to sort of sum me up, um, yeah, and and show me what I, I guess will naturally lean towards in different social situations. Mm. It's mm. interesting to think about that. And I, I guess this is my ignorance of the academic world, right? But mm. like that was the most academically <laughs> based report that I've ever received or yeah. ever experienced when it comes to summing up someone. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And probably the value of such a scale is, I don't know, I haven't done it, but yeah, from yeah. what you described to me, that it not only gives you like a score, but it, it comes with a qualitative description of of what you tend to do and you know that's quite useful for people where you know like a a, a mean score and then your score in a standard deviation on extroversion yes. is hard to interpret right yeah it's um it's more appealing to people when they have a little description definitely that that tells them things about that yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, i was just uh earlier when you were talking about the the primal sort of mm-hmm. approaches the pseudoscience primitive so, yeah, primitive yeah, part yeah, of me yeah. sorry part of my uh, my, uh miss, miss <laughs> no <worries. laughs> i'm terrible uh there used to be a show on mtv i don't it was it called the game do you remember this show oh, have you ever watched it, it maybe nah. it was called the game but yeah. anyway there was like there was three judges on a panel yeah and they'd send a bloke out into a nightclub <laughs> and then they would rate his performance to pick up women uh, <laughs> and it was oh. just like all that pick up artist pseudoscience uh, stuff watch this yeah this would be actually so entertaining yeah. yeah i'll find the name of it yeah, um, yeah. Also, yes. it's not on netflix is it uh oh i would I'm sure they would have found it by now if it was on yeah, netflix yeah, but it'll yeah. be somewhere in the yeah. plethora of no, information nice. on the internet yeah. yeah no that sounds fascinating i mean <laughs> it, it i'd be very skeptical as to the legitimacy of no, it there's like, no legitimacy yeah, no, yeah. No, there's nothing like yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's oh mate I, I remember one particular episode there was a bloke who just it, like he came across, I was 18, 17 when I'm watching yeah, this stuff yeah. and he came across as knowing the whole <laughs> art back to front. And there was this other bloke that was just taller and, and more handsome. And mm-hmm. he, he went into a club and like picked up every girl he spoke to. And the other bloke had all these lines and this, this like social mm-hmm. intelligence, as you might say, for lack of a better term, and just yeah. didn't do as well as this other guy who was like, Oi, can I buy a drink? Yeah. Like it just, yeah there was nothing to it. it was, these judges were hilarious though. Mm. That highlights yeah. a very important point about a lot of these pop psychology interventions is i don't know if you've heard the phrase before they can't see the forest for the trees um and that basically reflects in a lot of these pop psych approaches they're too focused on the details without seeing the bigger picture um so i think a lot of the time you know i I, like i've delved a bit into you know i don't i wouldn't claim to be knowledgeable about the entirety of these approaches and their interventions and what they teach people but i've had a brief read um and they're they're quite focused on the details of what people say to each other but they fail to to understand the bigger picture surrounding that so a good example is a lot of these pop psych interventions they take people that are not very successful with women they teach them something and then they throw them out and say have a crack and when you do that, you're of course going to get improvement because the baseline is so low. She won't have so, a crack before. Exactly. Well, yeah. 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 So that's one thing like people are just putting themselves out there, which they weren't doing before. The second thing is that these people self-select into these interventions. So they, um, you know, they want to improve. And so if you want to improve, then you improve. yeah, yeah. You're probably going to improve regardless of what happens to you. There's this expectancy effect, we call it. And then third is that, um, they they believe in what they're getting taught is effective, right? So regardless of whether it actually is or not, it's almost like a placebo happening for them. Yeah, so a lot of the things they're probably taught increase things like confidence yeah. and things like that, which help them to perform better interpersonally, but it's not the actual content of what they're saying yeah. it's, that helps. And And this goes back to a lot of the research that we've done in social intelligence, getting to the point that there's no universally correct answer uh, to a social problem or a social objective. So, you know, my approach to um, charming or persuading you is going to differ from my approach to Glenn based on the time of day, circumstance, all this sort of stuff. So, you know, you're, you're drinking Kool-Aid if you think that, you know, like one particular line is just going to work for, you know, every single girl at every single nightclub. There's, there's too much, uh, variance there. And so what, what's really important in 
to, to being socially effective is to be able to integrate that contextual specific information and then come up with a response that's going to give you the best chance of success. Yeah. And, you know, we think that that's more related to your cognitive abilities rather than the things you say. Yeah. That links quite heavily to the five points that you, you went through in your three yeah. minute thesis. Hey, yeah, like it's yeah. the, it's the, un- oh, well, again, I'm definitely not going to get the, the exact words, right. Mm. But it's identifying the situation, yep. uh, crossing out any, uh, any behavior or any interaction that wouldn't be appropriate, identifying other avenues yeah, of, yeah. of interaction and quickly doing it because if yeah. someone takes too long, yeah. uh, it's, it's ingenuine. Disingenuous. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I guess the thing there is that um, a lot of people know what is a socially appropriate response and they don't do it and they can recognize that even when they're, they're doing it, right. That when they're doing the incorrect <laughs> thing. So in order to stop yourself from doing that, you need to be able to inhibit it inhibit your dominant response when, when it's inappropriate, you need to recognize it's inappropriate, but then you also have to have the ability to inhibit it. You know, Bill's found that with a lot of older people, because when you age, you lose your inhibitory control. They can't really stop themselves from saying inappropriate things. Interesting. Um, so yeah, that's important in a social context. And then when you inhibit your dominant response, when it's inappropriate, you need to replace it with something, right? Yeah. So in order to do that, you need to generate a a wide variety of replacements. Then you need to select the most appropriate one. And that all has to be done fast because otherwise you'll end up like Tony Abbott (laughs) when he was asked a question. I can't remember, it was by Seven News. And he's like umming and ahhing for a good minute and just nodding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I can't remember the exact question either, but I just remember how awkward I felt watching that. Yeah, Exactly. I think it was something to do with the military, but yeah, he he didn't handle it well. (laughs) Yeah. And you can imagine that, you know, this is the phenomenology of like choking yeah. when when a lot of these dudes like go up to females and, you know, it's probably not an issue of mental speed there, more so they're just scared shitless. Yes. And um, yep. yeah, they, even though they might know what they want to say, they just can't say it. Yeah, like yeah. it's that fight, flight and freeze sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, do you, uh, have you read much up on Sam Harris or do you know much? Yeah, about yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I listen to a bit of Sam Harris's yeah. stuff. Yeah. Do, do you think uh, like that, you mentioned that as you get older, it becomes harder to inhibit was yeah, sort of the word. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, do you think that that's, you can mitigate that through meditation, through being more aware? Like I, 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 uh, when I first was introduced to Sam Harris, I mm. downloaded that Headspace app yeah, a few awesome. years ago and I was doing that for 10 minutes every morning for a while and I stopped for reasons so I'd, I'd, like we can talk about later. But, mm. um, but I found, I felt like, and maybe this was a placebo, but I felt like, especially at work in, in conversations that were difficult or in heated moments, mm. I was able to be more present yep. and think more clearly about the consequences of what I might, might've said or might mm. say rather than just reacting and, and, and emotionally responding. Mm. Uh, and yeah, like, uh, do you see merit in that? It, it, can it be mitigated as you get older? Yeah, so meditation is a really interesting topic and there's a lot of great research done on it. Um, I think for, you know, folks like you and I, um, meditation can definitely be quite centering. And, um, you know, we tend to, when we catastrophize about things, that kind of increases this amygdala activation. And, you know, when your amygdala is activated, it, it short circuits your frontal right. lobe, which is part of your brain responsible for your ability to inhibit stuff. Yeah. Um, so that's why, you know, when people are angry, they often run their mouth off and sure. say things that they later regret. Yeah. And, you know, meditation is awesome there if you can get into that present mindedness in the moment. And there's definitely evidence to, to suggest that regular meditation helps you do that in those key instances okay. so if you're a practice meditator you can center yourself a lot better when you feel like your affect is getting out of control um unfortunately for older people the issue is not really uh, one that can be overcome with training at least to a large extent because it's literally coming back to like atrophying brain matter so although you know these training you know meditation might help for folks like you and i um, the effect, if any, is going to be quite reduced for old people. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I don't know that research super well, but um, that's just my understanding of it. Yeah. 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 So uh, again, as you as you age, things. Uh, man, I had the word in my head. Um, 
deteriorate. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And yeah, it's, it's yeah. just that, right? It's the those parts of your brain deteriorating and not doing their jobs as well as they could when they were younger. Exactly. It's like your knees and yeah, like yeah. any other part of the body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It yeah. just doesn't stop below the neck. No, that's yeah, it. Yeah. But you know, with I guess this, the benefit is that you you don't just become decrepit when you're old, like. It's painting old people in a bad way, but you, you gain a lot of crystallized intelligence as you age. So of course. although you might be a bit ruder uh, <laughs> and more inappropriate in some cases, generally elderly people are quite wise. Generally. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I would love to talk to you about mm. your your cross-cultural yeah. psychology work. Of course. Uh, like when when did you do that as part of your mm. your studies and and what were what what did you, I guess your research focus on? Yeah, so the whole point of my cross cultural work in Vanuatu was to follow up a lot of the social intelligence work that I did with Australian populations. Sure. So I guess it'll make won't make much sense unless I recap those findings. Mm. So my whole line of social intelligence work has yeah. Focused. Sorry, I skipped ahead. No, yeah, no, say, that's all good. <laughs> man. Apologies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for bringing me back. Yeah. <laughs> but um. My whole objective in my social intelligence research has been to look at these individual differences. So why are some people more socially effective than others? And as as we touched on briefly back there, it comes back to these five abilities. So your ability to detect changes in social contingencies. Uh, that's the first one. Second is your ability to inhibit your dominant response when it's inappropriate. The third is to generate alternative responses to take the place of that other response that was inhibited. Uh, fourth is to select the correct one and then fifth is to do all that fast right so in our lab in bill's lab um, we've got evidence for three out of those five abilities that they relate to how socially effective you were so the contingency sensitivity the inhibitory ability and then mental speed they all predict social social effectiveness in various different forms um, so my research was focusing on generating alternative responses and selecting the correct one. And my dissertation in particular was focused on our, our ability to generate the alternatives and how that relates to social effectiveness. Um, and so building on preliminary work done from a colleague of mine, um, we look at this ability called um, divergent thinking, which is essentially that, your ability to generate multiple uh, solutions to okay. complex problems. We measure that in the lab with a task called the alternate uses task, which is the AUT for short. And so in this task, I ask you, Carl, uh, name five different uses for a brick or any other common household object. Yep. And the uses that you generate are then scored by people for how diverse they are. Okay. So, you know, you might, I might give you you know, come up with five different uses for this coffee cup. Yeah. And you would say, I could use it as a weapon, a doorstop, yeah. a paperweight, uh, maybe like a rolling pin. And a cup. Yeah, and a cup. Yeah. yeah. But that would be an example that isn't different from its right. intended oh, use. Oh, so sorry, it's the aim to yeah, come to up come with, up with examples that are intended, intended sure. use. Yeah, sure. exactly. So, um, yeah. And so that would be an example. That list I just said would be an example of a list that is quite a diverse yeah. list. Whereas using the cup to like, uh, you know, smash a plant or an animal or something like that or yeah. break a window or focus around this theme of smashing is not a very diverse set of yeah, uses. Back to that primitive sort of. <laughs> yeah, the primitive mind, the astral just yeah. pounding in heads <laughs> with coffee cups. Um, yeah, so that's an example of not a very diverse sure. use, uh, diverse list. So that would, that would get a low divergent thinking score, whereas that list I said formally would get a high yeah. um, one. So yeah, that's how we measure divergent thinking. How'd you come up with that? Did oh, this I didn't come up with that. Okay, yeah, this so is this a well established okay. measure oh, right. of divergent thinking. And so previously, yeah. divergent thinking has had uh, its focus in like creativity research, yeah. um, but it hasn't really been applied to social effectiveness as of yet. Before okay. I picked it up, and so what we would do is we would measure divergent thinking in people amongst other abilities, like their intelligence, the general cognitive ability, the personality with the Neo five factor inventory um, and a couple of other measures of social cognition, which is your ability to, you know, understand that a smile means happiness and a frown means unhappiness in its simplest form. Sure. So we would measure these cognitive abilities and social cognition in people. And then we would measure how uh, persuasive and humorous they are. And so persuasion and humor we settled on because they're two very important social goals. So 
Uh, you know, persuasion forms the basis of many of our social objectives, ranging from, you know, getting work to finding uh, a mate. And humor is a, a universally admired quality. So, you know, uh, cross-culturally, people enjoy other people that make them laugh. Yeah. Right? So they're the two, I guess, ways we operationalize social effectiveness. How do you measure those two things? Yeah, so with um, persuasion... so. First of all, we measure persuasion the persuasion and humor in two forms. Okay. The simplest form is using written measures. Sure. So with our written measures, we uh, for persuasion, we ask people to write a paragraph. First, they indicate their agreements with the phrase cats better than dogs. Then we tell them to write a paragraph arguing the opposing view. And that paragraph is rated for how persuasive it is. Um, for Interesting. Humor. So, yeah, so you get them to state a fact that they know to be true. And then convince, or not really a fact; it's their opinion. Oh, sorry, right? sorry, yeah, an yeah. opinion that yeah. they like is true to them. Pardon yeah, me. exactly. Yeah, and then write a, a blurb or write a, a piece of text that convinces uh, someone else otherwise. You're yeah, well, arguing the opposing. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and we do that because um, you know, because well, uh, that's completely creative, right? Like you're you're now arguing something that you don't believe in, so that yeah. adheres straight to persuasiveness. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you know, when you're trying to persuade someone, it's very you know, in some cases it's persuading them of something that you're a fan of and in other cases it isn't. And yeah. doing, persuading people uh, something against your opinion is a lot harder yeah. to do. So it's, yeah, it's the the harder, the more challenging version of it. It tests the skill rather than yeah, just exactly. how passionate you are about something. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah that's a good way of putting it. Um, so yeah, we that's what we get them to do with this that's written cool. task. Um, but obviously that's, you know, that has its limitations because- yeah. Um, you're not uh, speaking to someone. You have all the time in the world to sure. craft your uh, persuasive paragraph. And it also comes down to how good you are at writing, yeah. right? So, you know, even if I'm not very persuasive and compelling, I might just be an excellent writer. Yeah, um, or the way, other way around. Like you might be awesome and really persuasive vocally, but just mm. cannot write. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Very good way of putting it. So, yeah, that's that's just... That's a preliminary way of yeah. looking at someone's persuasiveness. How do you make that those findings objective? Like, I, I would find is there like a rubric that's already been created? I just I, I would find the person who's reviewing these these mm. paragraphs. Yeah, like how how do they stay objective when I guess yeah. identifying how persuasive one is versus another? That's a good question. First of all, we get we get the people rating the paragraph to indicate their level of agreement with it. Right. And so they rate a paragraph, which is in opposition to their level of agreement. Okay. So that's, I guess, number one. Second, we have it rated by eight people. Sure. And so uh, because you have eight people rating the paragraph, you can uh, calculate what's called intraday reliability. And so you, you can see if this paragraph is unanimously rated either high or low or yep. somewhere in between by people. And if there's a lot of, Agreement, that means that your raiders are doing their job and there's a consensus there. If not, then, you know, it's a little more opaque. Yeah. Yeah. So you can statistically look at that. Um, but, of course, it's not like everyone has the same opinion uh, on how persuasive these paragraphs are. But as long as this uh, inter-rater agreement is, you know, above chance, then... Yeah, there's consistency in the findings, that, like you said, are above yeah. chance. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that's that's how we do it for persuasion. And then yeah. humor is a little different. Um, we get we present participants with uh, two cartoons, um, and we get them to write a humorous caption for them. Okay. Yeah, and then that caption is then rated for how humorous it is. So these are these two written measures of humor and persuasion. But of course, they're not the full story because they're written. And so to improve the level of ecological validity, which is you know how is this actually measuring persuasion and humor in the real world? We get participants to evaluate each other on how persuasive and funny they are. So we get groups of friends into the lab, um, which, you know, we're just recruited from around the university campus. Yep. And so we have three people, you know, Carl, Glenn, myself, and then we rate each other for how persuasive and how funny we are. Right. Yeah. And, and obviously, yeah, like having that relationship and knowing each other exactly. as individuals, it's, I guess, holds its own merit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's that's a good point because, you know, oftentimes we could rate someone for how persuasive they are and it's just a one-off, but yeah. it's not a very good sample because you've only just met them. And then you could be more influenced by things like how good looking they are, sure. yeah, how tall, the tone of their voice, all those kind of things. But yeah. when you know someone, well, you know, yeah, yeah, you're rating them for, yeah. you know, hopefully a good year's worth of 
experience. So, yeah. yeah. And so I guess, that, yeah, getting back to the big picture there, we see, well, we find that the divergent thinking measure, this coffee cup task, the alternate uses task, predicts how persuasive and funny people are in written form. And then to a lesser extent for peer rated forms. Yeah. Yeah. That's so cool. So you mm. you guys were the first to to able to correlate the creative thinking, the divergent yep. thinking task to those yep. measures. That's so that's so cool. Yeah. Was that like just an awesome finding? Yeah, it was good. Yeah, yeah, like it was it was a very hard won battle because a lot of these so the methodologies surrounding these studies are quite hard. You know, you need to get groups of friends into the lab, you need to pay them in order to make sure that your that the effect is because of divergent thinking not just general cognitive ability you need to give them a proper iq test which costs money and takes time yeah. and so it was a very time consuming and and uh finance consuming <laughs> uh project but um yeah we got it done yeah. and um yeah now we're just uh in the process of getting it out the door and getting it published yeah so exciting yeah, but, yeah sorry oh yeah i was just gonna say like with a with a finding like this you want to you want to spend that money and time to make sure you're getting something reliable. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's why it's taken an entire PhD. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How long until the findings get published, do you know? I'm um, just a, basically a week or two to send them out. But of course yeah. the review, like we've sent them out before and then there's yep. been um, like the reviewers have uh, like pointed out things that they would like to see in yep. the next iteration of the paper. So we had to get in order to, um, improve some of the inter-rater reliabilities on the written measure. We got them re-rated in order to prove to them that no, these ratings are legit. doesn't change the findings. Yep. So, yeah. There you go. Yeah. And then, so then you ship off to Vanuatu. Yes, exactly. So, you know, we do this research in Australian populations, yep. right? And um, the next step to, to really make this finding compelling is to see whether it's, uh, whether it will be as observed in, um, uh, populations that aren't Western English industrialized, rich and democratic. So, you know, 90% of research in psychology is done on those five. Yeah. Yeah. On these weird participants, we call them, that's the acronym. And, um, no way. Say, say the five topics again. Does it Western actually English no, industrialized, rich wow. and democratic? Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. Yeah. It's a cool little, <laughs> yeah. Cool, cool little acronym. acronym. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, you know, that's, that's cool and everything like, it's not like a lot of these findings change dramatically, but if you're making claims about human universals, which we are, we're saying that this ability will predict social intelligence, you know, regardless of your ecology or economy, yeah. um, then you need to Better show evidence study all for humans, that. yeah. Yeah, because yeah. You know, it's entirely possible that these relationships are just artifacts of the fast-moving world that we live in today. You know, back in... Uh, well, Pleistine, when we're also Pleistocene, and then later on um, in Homo erectus, we were only living in groups of about 30 to 50 individuals max. Mm. Um, and so we weren't confronted with the masses of people that we are, you know, living in an inner city. Yeah. And, and now with the internet. Yeah, like exactly. Just, just uh, exponentially uh, changes the amount of people that you're interacting with. And it yeah. might not be direct communication but still you need to use those social skills to communicate to people online and mm, even mm. just receive and hear feedback read people's comments and thoughts like it's just it's crazy how many ideas that we we have the ability to experience now yeah our, our exposure yeah. to other people is yeah magnified exponentially yeah. but you know with that comes the possibility that well maybe our ability to charm and persuade people was you know more dependent on familial ties or um, just how well we, we knew other people. Right. So yeah, that's, that was our rationale for going to Vanuatu. And, um, we went there, we adapted a lot of these measures, like the alternate uses task to be appropriate for, uh, this different culture, which, you know, speaks a different language to English and, yep. uh, has different customs. And they also don't have a huge degree of formal education either. Right. So, you know, we couldn't really give them the written measures as we did. What we did instead was to measure networks, friendship networks over in Vanuatu. Um, so we would give uh, Ni Vanuatu males in this village of Mele, which is a small, we call it, call it peri-urban village. So it's kind of uh, transitioning towards being urban, but sure. still quite rural. Yep. Um, and people still live quite a similar lifestyle to what they did you know, a hundred years ago. Sure. 
Um, so yeah, very different culture to our own. And so we gave uh, the Neve Vanuatu people there these measures of divergent thinking. We also gave them, uh, we asked them to nominate their 10 closest friends. And from that, we built this network, this social network of the village. Um, unfortunately, it became apparent to us that there were far more people in the village than we expected. We were also not able to sample that entire network. So we only got a, a chunk of it. Sure. And therefore what we, what we had sampled is not as reliable as the full sample. So the, the conclusions we could draw for that from that were quite limited. Um, so we didn't really find a relationship between divergent thinking and network centrality, which is an indicator of how popular yep. you are. Um, but we did find a link between economic success and network centrality. So the more economically successful Ni Vanuatu were, the more central they were in the network. Yeah. yeah but again, these findings are very, uh, you know, speculative because, you know, we just don't have the time or funding to do it properly. Yeah. Yeah. But it was still a, a great experience, um, you know, going over there and doing research in a small scale society, um, you know, having to learn the language, getting immersed in the culture and collecting the data. It was great. Yeah. yeah. What a cool experience. I read your, like mm. your blog, your diary entries, sorry. Ah, yeah, yeah, on UQ, yeah, yeah, yeah. it was cool. Like the, mm. so you got, you got clearance, but then a chief still had to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So how it works in Vanuatu is that um, there's like municipal chiefs that uh, are responsible for governing these villages. So the, that's, the, the, the Vanuatu government, obviously, you know, that has a police force. And so if the chiefs aren't, you know, doing their job or it breaks down for whatever reason, they can send in the cops, sure. make sure it doesn't descend into anarchy. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, these tribal ways of governing the villages actually work quite well in modern day. So similar to how places like Groot Island um, in far North Queensland, still uh, the Australian government allows them to be kind of governed traditionally yep. by this um, uh, chief system. Yeah, it's just like what happens in Vanuatu. Yeah, yeah. No, very cool. Very interesting. Yeah, so hey. the chief has the power to kibosh you. You know, even if the Ni Vanuatu government says like, yeah, you're all good, do your research. Yeah. The chief doesn't like it, then you, yeah, still, you got the boot. Still no go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Fortunately, he did. It was a good bloke. Nah, yeah. That's awesome. That's good yeah. to hear. But yeah, like mm. it, it's so interesting to, me, interesting to me. I listened to Michael Malice re recently on oh, Jordan no, no. Peterson's podcast. Oh, he's, okay, yeah. he's just a really popular uh, journo. Mm. I don't know. I saw a comedian as his label. I'm not sure if he is, but um, super switched on when it comes to the political, uh, I guess, climate over in America. Mm. And he's an anarchist. And I was just thinking about, like we, we spoke about obviously these small groups and small communities and like anarchy to me makes no, like I don't understand how it would work. Mm. Uh, but like thinking about it, like in a chief system, it almost could, like if there was a respect between. Well, that's not, yeah. The thing is there is it's not really anarchy because there's yeah. governments, the governance, yeah, sure. it's just not, you know, Western governance as we know it. Yeah. And so the, the chiefs are on point there. Like, you know, if a chief's doing his job, uh, if you steal a pig, like, yeah. you know, you <laughs> Gonna need to do face the consequences. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. You do these sorry ceremonies. So uh, yeah, they don't, they don't muck around. Um, a sorry ceremony? Yeah. So in Vanuatu, it's this, very fascinating tradition where so let's say you've got a pig and i steal it yeah um in order to make things right again to ameliorate the grievance that i've inflicted on you um i need to give you something and then you need to give me something as well and so right. that's that's the and, and that's ceremony it's done ceremoniously so we drink this um drink called kava yep. which is like a kava before yeah yeah, yeah. Well, i've had a lot of kava. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we drank it like yeah too much in Vanuatu. <laughs> um, but yeah, we would, we would have a carver ceremony yeah. and then, um, you know, I would say sorry and give you something and then you would also give me back something. So yeah. it doesn't really make much sense to my like Western eyes because like, why would I give you something? If, yeah. Like, why would you have to give me something if I stole your pig? Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's just their way of resolving conflict over there. So yeah. interesting. Mm. Yeah. It's so cool. Mm. Um, yeah. Like I, like I, I completely relate to what, why would I give you something if you've stolen mm. my pig? But I guess it's just that like we're moving on. This is a mutual respect relationship. Yeah. Like it's, this is something that is going to allow the water to, uh, well, what am I trying to say? The water under the bridge. What's that? Yeah. Saying? Yeah. Water under the bridge. bridge. Yeah. 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 The water's out. yeah, yeah. That, that's it. I, I guess yeah. that's, that's so interesting. You also mentioned earlier, uh, 
like economic success mm-hmm. um, and the the social network correlated and mm. uh, like that jumped out to me it, it makes sense right like I think about like, oh we can get a bit conspiratorial and get into the olig- uh, oligarchy mm-hmm. and the people running the world but then also the people like it that like Trump let's use Trump as an example mm-hmm. like his social intelligence I'm sure is through the roof right like is well maybe maybe yeah. or maybe it isn't because maybe. a lot of the shit he says is like really dumb or like true if you listen semantically to what he says it just makes no sense yeah but, but um, he's still in like he still achieves this response like it, it, maybe mm. he i don't know like i maybe might be giving him too much credit but i mm. genuinely think he's a genius yeah. like he, he's been able to get like a, a massive amount of people to follow and to almost destroy a, a system that's been there for hundreds of years. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it's just fascinating to me. And mm. I, I guess like he, he al- always had obviously his ability to amount his wealth, to start Trump towers, to be on mm. the apprentice, to like, to be this figure. He's now probably one of the most famous people on the planet. Mm. And like, I was just thinking like, he's obviously economically sounds these Very days. successful. Yeah. And uh, I, I was just thinking about like the, the people that would get ahead and be quite, economically sound in western culture would it would make sense that they do have social well, social intelligence a high level of social mm, intelligence mm. yeah 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 trump's an interesting one there because yeah the machiavellian trump hypothesis that he's just secretly this genius and <laughs> all these rants are carefully orchestrated Constructed, yeah i yeah, think that's yeah. what I'm, I'm like subconsciously trying to explain yeah yeah, yeah. i mean yeah uh, yeah without like delving too much into politics <laughs> like trump is obviously a very uh how would you say like he's a compelling figure, Mm. right? I'm not necessarily convinced it's from the content of what he says more. So just the, the, the themes surrounding what he's talking about. So, you know, he's very good at obviously connecting with a disenchanted population and um, they really couldn't care less what comes out of his mouth as long as it's something vaguely in the ballpark of what they want to hear. Right. So he obviously has a huge influence as well. Like he has a big platform has a lot of, uh, yeah, has a lot of, uh, has a large presence in America, um, is well, well renowned. So, yeah. 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 So, so interesting. Mm. Like we, Glenn and I speak about it quite a lot. Like it's, uh, I, politics for me has never been interesting. Mm. Never been, never cared for it. Never, yeah. um, like I, like I know ScoMo is our, uh, prime minister because mm. of ScoMo. Like if it was yeah, just ScoMo, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. Right. But yeah. just the, to watch everything happen over there over the last four to six years has almost been like its own reality TV show. It's yeah. been so entertaining. And I guess like it's, it's sprouted this interest for me mm. in politics, but we don't have to dive too, too deep mm, into that. Yeah. Yeah. Talk for another um, time. Mate. Yeah, for the sure. The interesting thing there though, is that what happens in Western countries is quite far removed from how we governed ourselves in an ancestral environment. So as I mentioned previously, we lived in these groups of about 30 to 50 people maximum yeah. and then in these kind of this ancestral group living environment if we didn't like a leader we could just leave or kill him in his sleep yeah. right um but now we because we have this you know state monopolized control over people we i mean we can still leave but yeah, yeah it's very different so people were were a lot more egalitarian in in governance when they were living in ancestral environments so they were just follow who they wanted to yeah, rather than elect someone. There's quite a consensus and it's easier to get a consensus when there's 30 to 50 people in a group rather than like millions upon millions. Yeah, no, of mm. course. Do, do, I have to ask this question. Mm. Like do you, when you think about the future, like are mm. you optimistic yeah. and, and do you see it? Oh, well that's obviously an answer in itself, but yeah. like, do you see it becoming more and more controlled by the state? Like is I, like I, I don't know how I fall politically. Like I think about how it might be easier to achieve happiness and and us all to get along in smaller groups and smaller communities. Mm-hmm. And as the the group gets bigger, it's much harder to agree. It's much mm-hmm. harder to get anything done. It's much harder to move forward. Then you you fall into okay. Well, then it makes sense for the government to have insight into everything that we do, so they mm-hmm. can make the right decisions. But then that eliminates your ability to be free to speak without worry about consequence. Mm. Like it, it's, I, I well, like, yeah, well, let's get back to the, the question. Like, are mm. you optimistic about where we're headed? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. I think, 
I would consider my view to be aligned with, I don't know if you're familiar with a guy called Steven Pinker. Yes, I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah. got a lot of good books. Yeah. Um, and I think he's got a very articulate viewpoint on this is that the quality of life for people uh, in nearly all measurable forms has improved yeah. over the past you know, thousand years or even more than that, the past couple of thousands of years. So, you know, people aren't dying anymore from starvation like they were even a hundred years ago yeah. in the 1920s. Starvation was far higher than it is now. Um, and we, we still do, although like some people might not have you convinced that it is this way, but we still do quite have quite a lot of liberty in what we say yeah. in the speech. So yeah, I mean, any isolated event looking at free speech and things like that, I tend to think of it as like a pendulum. So you can kind of swing one way. So, you know, we have a bit more free speech and yeah. maybe a bit less, but it, it tends to sort of self-correct itself yeah. over time. So yeah, almost like a sine wave. Um, and so while there's a lot of outcry, you know, social justice warriors and all that sort of stuff and academia, you know, it's kind of the, the forefront yeah. of um, the speech wars. Um, but yeah, I, I have, again, no one can really be certain, but I have uh, quite an op optimistic view that, you know, it'll, it'll self-correct. Self yeah. 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 I tend to think the same and my opinion is definitely less educated, <laughs> but yeah, no, yeah. like I, I, I think similarly, like you, you see, especially in 2016, like political correctness just four years ago, mm. five years ago now, um, was just such a, a hot button word. It was, everyone was getting lit on fire for anything that they said or did. And yeah. that's happening less now, but then, the, but, but it seems that there's more consequences for definitely people in mm. academia that yeah. like speak out um, or, or just try and share an opinion that might not fit whatever this narrative has to be. That's not clear or outlined to anyone mm. uh, except for the, the white middle-aged women that are screaming on Facebook. That's definitely yeah. a generalization, but yeah, like I, I hope to, I hope to. Yeah. Uh, See that movement originally, I'm, I'm sympathetic with it because it came out of a good place, right? Yeah. So, you know, back in the 50s, 60s and 70s with the civil right movement, you know, th these were things that uh, needed action taken. Definitely. Right? But since then, it's almost like the low hanging fruit has all been plucked. Yeah. And so the, the active kind of social justice sector is now going after whatever you know, they can. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. But then they're getting opposed by, you know, people like the, the Trump supporters in America standing up and pushing back against like, all these regulations and like pro Definitely. free speech. So yeah, it's self-correcting pendulum, I think. Yeah. yeah. yeah no, well said. Yeah. No, I think uh, Bill, Bill used the analogy of like when he was younger, he fell out of a car because he didn't have his seatbelt. Yeah, yeah. There was no seatbelt. Exactly. So, uh, yeah. The parent brain Bill to uh, the parent that was he was in the car off, bring Bill to his mum and like dusted him off and away he goes. And yeah, told him to hang on. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> hang on next time. Yeah. Um, now kids aren't falling out of cars, so we've got to we've got to find something to be upset about or something to fix. Yeah, um, but you know, like yeah. that, you know, there's there's been a lot of sanitization of uh, you know kids play, but recently a lot of research has come out about making things more dangerous. Yeah, so there's you know developmental research done. Um, about just basically giving kids a whole bunch of like ladders and all this kind of stuff. They can set up their own play gyms and it encourages them to work together and to be social. So yeah, although we might, you know, people might go on about, oh, you know, there's nothing wrong with a scraped knee or anything. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. And, and we may have bubble wrapped a lot of things. It yep. is still moving back that way. That's so empirically. good to hear. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Cause mm -hmm. I wasn't aware of any of that literature. Yeah. Like I just, I see it as everyone who is, I guess in the general population sees it as we're getting soft or you think the other way. And now we need to protect our kids at all costs. And, yeah. and like, I think about like every time I've been challenged in my life, mm. like I've become a more round, well rounded yeah. person because of it. And if we take all of the challenges away from our kids, mm we're creating these victims. You see it right now. Yeah, like yeah, people yeah. have this mentality that the world sucks and they spied everyone around them and they blame everyone else for their problems. And yeah. I think that's a direct consequence of them being told, yeah, you're perfect their whole life growing up. Mm. Um, or, or unfortunately they've had a really un unfortunate upbringing anyway, but yeah, I went on a bit of a tangent there. I'm sorry. No, that's ha good. Ha has your perspective, how did your perspective change as you went through university? Like as mm. a, 
as a 17 year old yeah, and yeah. then finishing a PhD. Yeah. I'd be really interested to hear about like your, just your perspective on the world, your perspective yeah. on people. Mm-hmm. Like do you analyze yourself and the people you meet? <laughs> like, how, No, how if anything, I, I probably do it less. I mean, like when I first started my PhD or even when I first started university, I was like, as Bill refers to it, like he calls himself this, but I was just a clueless fuck with. Yeah, right? yeah. Like, <laughs> and so I had, you know, looking back on myself, I just I was so stupid. Like I, I knew nothing. Um, and as I've become more educated and, and done all this research into human behavior and been exposed to a lot of research and other people, other academics and all this sort of stuff, um, we call it the Dunning-Kruger effect, yeah. which you might be familiar of. Yeah, the- yeah, you realize how much you don't know. Those unknown unknowns become known unknowns. So I'm still a clueless bucket, but yeah. at least I know uh, what I don't know. You're consciously incompetent exactly. instead of unconsciously incompetent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, um, but that also brings with it quite an inner peace. Like yeah. when you understand humans a bit more and you understand yourself, um, you don't really fear them as much. And so I, I think I've become the most self-confident, self-assured version of myself awesome. uh, in the past four years that I've ever been. Yeah. That's so I guess cool. it's given me quite a, I guess big, going more big picture, it's given me quite a charitable view of human nature. So, you know, this has come about of, come about from a lot of the evolutionary psychology work that I've done with Bill and colleagues. And, and the, the real heartwarming thing about human nature there is that, you know, we really are at our core, a cooperative species. Yeah. And um, we're the only species really that's chosen to cooperate um, and evolve this strategy as a way of overcoming social problems. Uh, correction, not social problems, but overcoming problems handed right. to us. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, it's very possible we could have, as Bill writes in his book, we could have evolved a strategy like seagulls to be very inherently competitive with each other, but we didn't. And that's super fortunate. So, yeah, yeah I think that gives me a, an optimistic view of human nature. We'll always cooperate. We might, you know, have our little issues and yeah. you know, swing back and forth with the pendulum on different socio-political things. But, yeah, we'll eventually self-correct and continue forward. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a beautiful place to, to end this show. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. No, uh, Sam, thank you so much for your time. Pleasure. I've, I've really loved, I guess, digging into your brain a little bit more. Yeah. And it's cool. Like I love speaking to Bill, but in hindsight, I think I was a little bit taken aback that I was actually speaking to Bill. Mm. And then also, uh, yeah, I just, again, similar, similarly, I think there was so many things I wanted to cover with him that mm. it took away from being more natural and, and yeah, maybe because yeah. it was like an elder that I just respected, right? Not mm. that I don't respect you. Yeah, yeah, no. I thought it was just so cool to, like you said, follow your heart and just to see where the conversation went. And yeah, yeah I'm sure, uh, yeah, this won't be the last time we have a yarn. But Brilliant, yeah. Thank you so much for your time, oh, It's Sam. been a pleasure being here. Yeah. I hope it was fun. It was, definitely. Good to hear. And for everyone at home, thank you for your for your time. Yeah, sorry, I'll keep looking over here. But no, thanks for having a listen. I hope you enjoyed this chat with Sam. Uh, if you like what we're trying to do, hit the like button, do all that fun stuff. Uh, you can find Sam on LinkedIn. Mm. Uh, he, do I don't have, check it very yeah, often. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but definitely look up his work. Watch his three-minute thesis. It's really interesting. <laughs> and uh, if you want to learn more, I'm sure he'd be happy for you to reach out to him. Uh, yeah. But No, uh, thank you, Sam, and thanks, everyone, and we'll uh, see you next week.